Hello, ladies. Welcome to the Hourly to Exit podcast. I am so excited for today's guest, Kylie Hodges. Hi, Kylie. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, uh, we have lots to talk about. This is one of those episodes where there are a dozen things regarding the hourly to exit journey that we could talk about, but we're going to try to narrow it down to a couple. But before we get started, would you introduce yourself to the audience? Of course. Uh, My name is Kylie Hodges. I help ambitious community builders convert enthusiastic fans to paying clients by building profitable businesses. So working with me, uh, people learn how to utilize their natural ability to attract community and create connections that actually convert. Uh, They learn to structure and sell impactful offers and programs, and they learn how to grow while working with their ADHD, anxiety, or depression. And the goal is so that they can make the kind of money and impact that makes them want to yell, hell yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, I'm glad you you mentioned the ADHD, anxiety, and depression, because those really stuck out. They really popped for me on your website. And so I want to, you know, and obviously it all is part of connection and community, but in particular, like, how did you focus on that? Have you found that the similarities of that market are kind of psychographic, like women of a certain age or more psychographic, you know, uh, you know, they have these challenges and they need help with these specific challenges? Yeah, good question. So I've just found, you know, uh, I, I say this to my clients, you can build what you can speak to and. I can speak to that experience. I'm someone that is diagnosed with ADHD, anxiety, and depression. And when I was diagnosed with those things as a, (laughs) as a chronic oversharer, I learned (laughs) that a lot more people could relate to me than I realized. And so, yes, I'm a business coach, but if I wasn't acknowledging what was going on with me internally, then I couldn't even apply my own practices. And so it became a no brainer that if I'm struggling with this, my clients are certainly struggling with this too. And so let's do the revolutionary thing and actually serve ourselves while we're serving others. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's when we both ha- are coming at our businesses from similar perspectives where I, yeah. of course, work with uh, experts to help them turn their expertise in intellectual property and build scalable and scalable businesses. And, you know, that hourly to exit journey, I mean, is there any more hourly entrenched profession than lawyers and, you know, building a business where I'm not just trading my time for money and, and you have, you know, our issues are our clients issues in so many ways. Oh yeah. But back to the ADHD, I'm going to stick with that for a second. Cause because, yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like ADHD is one thing we think about that in children We don't think about it that much as adults and adults getting that diagnosis can be really revelatory. The things that they're so frustrated with, how come I can't follow through? How come I can't focus? You know, how did you, when did you get diagnosed and what did it look like before and after? Well, I got diagnosed. um, Actually, that's a good question. I think it was in 2021. No, it was, it was very early 2022. However, I had spent about a year advocating for myself to get diagnosed. Um, and look, I'm not a medical doctor. I can't speak to (laughs) like getting yourself diagnosed, but for me and what I've learned from other people or mostly other women identifying folks is that, uh, a couple of things, um, it's not easy to get diagnosed as an adult, Mm -hmm. mainly because the medication linked to it is addictive. It usually results in getting medicated with Adderall, which I do have a prescription for, and I've actually been trying to go off of it, but that's just my own personal preference. I'm trying to figure out how to work with my ADHD and not just medicate it, even though it has been really helpful at times. The other thing is, um, there's still, uh, in the medical community, there isn't actually any, um, ugh, I'm not a doctor, so I'm like missing the terminology, but basically in the medical textbooks, there's not any particular thing about adult onset ADHD. It's a thing that you look for in kids. And then if you don't get it as a kid, then it's like, well, they probably don't have it. 
And I didn't have it as a kid. And I absolutely think COVID and the massive life changes that happened to all of us during that year plus really messed with me in a way that amplified whatever symptoms I had that were maybe a little bit ADHD. They just skyrocketed. So before I got diagnosed with ADHD, I struggled with really basic stuff that I was really ashamed about being on time, getting out of bed, which is also linked to depression um, and anxiety, um, being able to listen. Like I, I really want to listen, but my mind would do me dirty and take yes. me in another direction. <laughs> um, what are some other symptoms? Oh, and, um, like overwhelming to-do lists. So, you know, I, I still do it, but I'm better at recognizing it, but I have pages of to-do lists. And, and in my mind, it's like, yeah, I can do all this in, you know, an hour, of course. It's very all or nothing, black and white thinking. <laughs> and, and do I still struggle with this now after my diagnosis? Yes. However, getting diagnosed is like a relief because it just gives an explanation for what's going on with me. And it the, the biggest change I would say is that I was able to identify it's not an inherent flaw of who I am. It is not who I am that I struggle with organization in my business, that somehow I'm always procrastinating and everything gets down to the last hour or minute. Um, it, it's just a symptom of a thing that I've got. Mm -hmm. And now I just need to acknowledge it, uh, detach myself from identifying to it. It's not who I am inherently and figure out how to work around it. So I'm really blunt with my clients. Like mm -hmm. I don't do early morning stuff. Mornings are just really hard for me. Um, I don't do, uh, I try to do everything that would be like, if I could press the easy button, how can I make this happen in an easy way? Because overcomplicating stuff is a symptom of ADHD. And then when you pile on depression and anxiety, it results in, in freezing and doing nothing, which then amplifies depression and anxiety. So to me, I found like asking myself, what is the easy button here is the way to help me navigate running my business successfully despite struggling with ADHD and anxiety and depression. Right. That is great. And so have you found that women are coming? Well, I'm assuming that you work with mostly women. Tell me, yes. tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. Most, most of my client base <laughs> is women. Um, I don't currently have any male clients, but I have in the past. Yeah. And so are people self-identifying and going, you know, I've got these issues where I think I have these issues. So let me go talk to Kylie because she understands me. You know, what's funny is my most recent client who I got, she was like, I think I have this and I think I have that. And after she hired me, it was, she just needed the accountability and the gumption or the validation from someone else to get herself to go speak with her, her doctor. Mm -hmm. So like, again, I'm not diagnosing people <laughs> and I'm not like, if you think you have ADHD, don't come to me first, just go to your doctor. <laughs> but what she was noticing was she was struggling with things in her business and yeah, she absolutely needed a tweak in her marketing strategy and sales strategy. But first what she needed to do was take care of herself internally because she was allowing her behaviors, which it turns out she does have diagnosed anxiety and ADHD. Um, she wasn't, the way she was behaving with herself was resulting in fractures in her business foundation. And so we did a deep dive. She made an agreement that she was going to go talk to her doctor and also start therapy. And wouldn't you know it once she did those things, then the ball started rolling and she could finally show up and work for herself. Right. Yeah. And so it's very common. It's very common in that if there's someone who is struggling, like they're like, I just can't get myself to do this, or I can't seem to make a decision here. It might be you're confused. It might be you really don't know what a, a helpful marketing funnel looks like for you, but it also might be that like you're treating the CEO of your business really poorly 
<laughs> and you need to give that person the health and the self-care that they need in order to show up for work. Right. Yeah. I often wonder how much of resistance is actually resistance because, you know, you just don't want to do it or whatever the barriers are versus yeah. something like, you know, brain fog or ADHD or something similar. And it's, I think it's a kind of a continuum of things, but there are many things that we need coaches to help us work through, not all mm -hmm. medical things, but some mindset issues, organization issues, and clarity. Let's put it that, yeah. put it that way. So yeah. tell me about how you work with your clients to help them kind of move forward. Great question. So like I said earlier about <laughs> how, how can I hit the easy button, I try to apply that to what is only the bare minimum information that my client needs to hear right now in order to move forward? Um, my goal of working with my clients is to help them get out of whatever is stop, get out of the way of whatever's stopping them and start taking action. I'm always saying, what's the D plus effort here? Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> D plus is not enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so there's a lot of perfectionism that gets wrapped up in in a lot of my clients. And that's also very much a symptom of, of all the things I listed. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I used to, this isn't necessarily, uh, advice, but when I was my senior year of college, my last semester, senior year of college, I was so ready to move. I was, I already had a job lined up. I was very lucky. And I was like, get me out of here. And my mantra became D's get degrees. <laughs> which again, if you are in college, maybe don't listen to that. But the reason I share it with my clients now is because like, we're going for D plus effort here because your first effort is not going to be an A. We have to accept that. Do the D plus work first, and then you can refine it to be a C and then a B and then an A. But to get yourself moving, we have to be okay with producing imperfect, messy firsts. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question of like, how do I work with people? How do I help them? A lot of my clients are, nat they have a natural ability where they attract people. They're really good at connecting and creating a sense of community. And they just haven't figured out how the heck to structure a business around it that's actually paying them well and going deeper with how they want to help people. So I really help them focus on, okay, what are your offers or services or products that are meeting people where they are and also taking you where you want to be going in your business? Like, what is that happy intersection? Um, what is your sales process doing that's also serving your community for good? Like, how can we flip that so that it's it's not I'm feeling salesy. It's I'm actually creating a deeper sense of connection when I am selling. Mm -hmm. And also it's your marketing. How are you using your marketing as a way to help your community connect with each other on a deeper level? So I really focus on those three things and it all ties back to how can we give the business owner the life, the space, the health, the money, and the impact that they really want. Mm -hmm. That's right, absolutely. And so one of the things that you <clears throat> mentioned is, totally blanking, I should have written it down. <laughs> <laughs> this is very relatable. I know, <laughs> I, I know, know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna just we're gonna just have to move on from that. Um, <laughs> gosh, I thought it was brilliant too. All right, <laughs> it probably was brilliant. <laughs> It'll come back to you tomorrow morning in the shower. <laughs> I hope so hopefully before <laughs> the end of this conversation, maybe. But okay, so when you work with your clients, then. So yeah. do you like to, do you work with them one-on-one -on -one or do you create community with them, work, the, work them in a community? Like how, what is your best way or most effective way? Yeah, good question. So I um, will not work with people only one-on-one. -on -one. And okay. it's because I know that there's so much value in being in community, even when you're mm -hmm. learning. 
So while um, my, my program is called the VIP Inner Circle, um, and it is a hybrid program. Yes, they get me as their private business coach, but also it's a mastermind format. So it's a very intimate and small group. Um, and there's training, there's Q&A, there's retreats. Um, we have accountability sessions or accountability and like co-working. Um, I do little micro boot camps on like, we're going to practice sales today. We're going to practice building out our, our marketing funnels today. Um, and the reason that I also strongly encourage my clients to never offer just one-on-one -on -one is because you're depriving people of a sense of connection and a sense of community that can help them feel more glued to what you're creating. Mm -hmm. Like you don't even need to be around necessarily, but when you create a container or a space for people to do co-learning or even just to develop relationships, that is strengthening the glue of your clients wanting to sign another contract. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's the gift that keeps on giving. It gives them an opportunity to learn a different way. And I kind I compare it to, you know, um my mom was always telling me put on sunscreen. And I was like, I don't want to listen to you, mom. Don't tell me what to do. But then I go on Instagram and I listen to the uh -huh. uh, beauty gurus say put on sunscreen and I'm like, did you know we need to put on sunscreen? I had no idea. So sometimes Clients just can't hear everything that comes out of my mouth because, you know, I'm mommy dearest in this situation. <laughs> um, they need to just hear it another way from someone else. And sometimes that means when their, their equals are in a space with them learning as they go, they can hear it better. They can hear it differently. I love that. So there are two things that you mentioned. So community as both an input, like helping feed you and your business, helping yes. you think about things differently, relieving some of the loneliness of, you know, what yes. is it now mostly a uh, primarily work from home environment for many, I'm sure many of your clients are working. Yes. Now, if not all of them. Mm -hmm. And then also it is an output as one yes. of the offerings as well. And so- Great. I, I love that, that, you know, like kind of that 360 degrees of the benefits of building community and community as a revenue model is not something I hear very often. Tell me how you help people work with that. Okay. First of all, very good ear that you noticed that whole community is a holistic thing. We as humans need it. We are, uh, we come from people that would die if they weren't in it back way back in the caveman days. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, part of the struggle I've experienced with ADHD and anxiety and depression were only amplified during COVID when I felt so isolated from community. And there is absolutely a parallel here in when we isolate ourselves in our businesses with our clients and also personally and emotionally, we're, we're restricting ourselves from what is possible. And when we lean into community internally in our businesses and externally in the way we show up in the world, it's only growth and expansion and, and, um, fulfillment and, and just being okay <laughs> is what's possible. So to get a little bit out of the like vague intangible feelings part of it and into the tangible stuff, what that looks like is this. The word leverage is like my favorite word in the world. Um, Me both. <laughs> let's leverage what you've got. So a lot of people hear community or f like I, I said earlier, I help uh, ambitious community builders convert enthusiastic fans. Sometimes people hear that and think, oh, influencers, like I don't, I don't have thousands of people on my email list. That's not me. It's actually not true. Um, your community is just, who are the people, you know, who are the people that are right there in front of you? Or maybe not even the people, you know, but the people who are following you on Instagram, you might not know all of them. So it's how can we leverage what we've got right now? How can we leverage that in our marketing? How can we, just like I said earlier, when you create a sense of community internally within your clients and that becomes the glue to keep them wanting more, 
Let's apply that to your marketing. When you're building out your marketing funnel, how can you have your community develop a stronger sense of connection with each other and you every step of the way along your funnel? Mm -hmm. That way you're making a bigger impact in the world. When you have, you know, a free offer of a free PDF or, you know, a free Facebook group or whatever, what can you do to help people develop a deeper sense of connection, not only to your messaging, but also other human beings in the process? That is a way to amplify your message, but also make a greater impact on the world. And a lot of the people that I work with are very message driven. They're people, people. And so they're building a business because they they have either a a natural talent or a very strong skill set, but also they really care about explaining the purpose of that message or that skill set globally. And so how can we do that? By creating little micro brand ambassadors every step of the way in your in your marketing. And when you're having sales conversations, making it not about you, but about the person you're talking to, that right there is deepening a sense of connection with that person. You're giving them a great gift, which is being heard. And then when they're inside your business, how are you helping them go deeper with the transformation they desire in terms of having them feel connected and plugged in to the other people and the type of space that can help them live into their, their most, their best self, for lack of a better term. I think that's, I think that's everything I was going to (laughs) say. I also forgot what I was going to say halfway through the answer. <laughs> We're going to make Ann work for this. this <laughs> so, so I'm going to come back to leverage because you and I oh, yes. both love that. But first, yeah. I'm going to go back to um, what you said about brand ambassadors and oh, yes. connection and community. I love that because yeah. it reminded me of my personal experience. If I'm allowed. So as we I mentioned before we started recording that I live in a kind of exurbs of Washington, D.C. And anyone who knows this area, like, you know, you don't go inside the Beltway unless, you know, like the president's being inaugurated. I mean, I, you know, otherwise I like, forget about it, right? And so yeah. this is pre-pandemic. Like I never, so I was out here, my little, you know, home office, doing my work. Um, there weren't really on a lot of online networking of opportunities. You had to go into the city to go to lunches or go to things. And, you know, it would take me longer to get into the city in the evening because of the reverse traffic than it would, you know, if you left in the morning. So I never did any stuff like that. And then COVID comes along, you know, worst thing ever, but it did. And suddenly there were all these opportunities to network online, to build community online. And it frankly has been a game changer for my business to be able Mm. to build community with so many people online and to create those little ambassadors. Like there's, these are things I never could have done without, you know, the people who I mastermind with, you know, that go out there and go, oh, you got to talk to Aaron or whatever, you know, or introducing me or be able to do, have conversations like this, you know, that just weren't really happening before. And so, um, yeah, I mean, community is 100%. It's, it, it is absolutely essential to our sense of well being. But so, you know, we just can't do this alone. We really do need our community around us to help, to help out. All right. So, May I say something about yes. the brand ambassador term? Yes. <laughs> so I want to just share a little bit about why I use that term and why it's so important. My first adult job after graduating college, was as the spokesperson and driver of the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. Do you know what that is? Yes. (laughs) When you asked if I'd been to D.C. before, my first time was in the Wienermobile (laughs) on Pennsylvania Avenue, of all places. And it's a 27-foot-long hot dog on wheels, and my job for one year was to drive that thing all around the country as the national spokesperson of it. So while the really sexy highlights are I was on the Today Show and CNN, and I got to close the bell at the New York Stock Exchange, most of the job (laughs) was actually really unsexy. It was standing in Walmart parking lots, handing out coupons, and taking pictures of people in front of it. But here's the thing. Whether I was on the Today Show being seen by a million people or standing in a Walmart parking lot in Lexington, Kentucky, talking to one person, my message was always the same and my goal was always the same. Um, To show up 
in a way that made people feel good and understood what I was doing there. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a false sense of making people feel good. It was just give people a moment of feeling heard and experiencing a little joy in their day. So internally, uh, as hot doggers, which was my job title, there were 12 of us. We were trained to be the Disney of Oscar Mayer. Give someone a delightful experience on their, you know, random Tuesday afternoon picking up groceries when it's a really hectic work week. And what I found was I was using the same talking points every day, all day. And we would measure how many people we spoke to by how many wiener whistles we gave away, which are those tiny little plastic toys. So I spoke to anywhere from 500 to 1,000 people a day. And what would happen was I would have a really delightful conversation with someone. How are you doing today? You ever seen the Wienermobile before? Oh, you grew up you grew up seeing it on TV. That's so fun. Would you like a picture with it? Oh my gosh, tell me more about your neighbor who used to work for Oscar Mayer. Really basic stuff. But that moment of connection, not only it, it made me feel good because I was able to just bring a little joy to someone's day. It's pretty easy to make someone smile when you're driving a giant hot dog car. Yes. But also because I understood that my messaging was getting through to them in the way that I was instructed to do so. But also it made them feel good because they would always say, oh, I'm going to, um, can you take a picture of this in front of me? I'm going to show this to my grandkids. They're going to love this. And I always try to channel that now in my business. Like I was a literal brand ambassador for a hot dog company. Okay. <laughs> and I know that it's a lot easier to get people to want to share about seeing a 27 foot long hot dog car at Walmart than it is to run into a lady who's a business coach and talking about marketing funnels and sales strategies. However, I channel that in everything that I do. And I tell my clients to do the same. What can you do to evoke a stronger sense of joy or ease or whatever it is that you are trying to create in your, in your business and do that in tangible ways while connecting with people so that they want to go out and be brand ambassadors. And in the Wienermobile, how did I know that I was creating brand ambassadors? Because people would post the picture I took of them on social media and tag Oscar Mayer. Or they would share it in the Oscar Mayer Facebook page. And they would say, I loved talking to Ketchup Kylie today. So now I think about how can I measure the brand ambassador impact in my own business? Well, how many clicks am I getting on this link? How many views or how many shares? You know, it's it can translate however you need it to. But the purpose is always, is the messaging and the way I'm showing up actually making a tangible impact? And that's why I say, Let's create people who are brand ambassadors. What can we do within ourselves to get our message across in a way that activates people to take action? Right. Yeah, I like that. And you know, it reminds me of um, just a couple of people. I want to say certainly Jonathan Stark, uh, who talks about you know ha <clears throat> having a brand that is very um, like a, people have a Rolodex moment. So when they think about like if someone says, you know, I'm looking for someone to help me with strategy or, you know, they immediately think of, you know, Kylie or, you know, I'm looking for. And, uh, and so to be able to get there, I imagine that you help people get that type of positioning and, uh, and uh, you know, referability so that they can really have a really tight, tight message for their, for their intended audience. Yeah. And you know, what's funny is I noticed that a lot of my clients come to me thinking that it's like figuring out their messaging or their branding is like a Rubik's cube. They just haven't cracked the code yet. Mm -hmm. And it's not as complicated, or at least the way I approach it is like, it doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be clear and concise. Mm -hmm. And you have to be okay with it not being clear and concise right away. Yeah. But the more you try it on like an outfit, the more you see what fits and what works. So Yes. And there's so much, it's, it's a lot of just getting started and like seeing the feedback you get mm -hmm. from others to see if that messaging is working in the way you want it to work for you. Yeah. Yeah. It is tough to, you know, out at a dinner party or someplace and someone asks what you do and, you know, you could say, well, I'm a lawyer or whatever. 
versus, you know, saying I help experts, you know, turn their, you know, build scalable and sell business. Yeah. And so it takes, a, it does, it's a muscle that you have to, to exercise because it's super easy just to, you know, kind of, oh, when I'm a marketer, yes. I'm a accountant, I'm, you know, and kind of keep going. So, yeah. yeah. And what is that, <laughs> what is that thing you're telling yourself when your instinct is, oh, I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, it's like, oh, they don't actually want to hear. Yeah. But again, creating a brand ambassador out of someone means that you have to share, you have to give them the enthusiasm that you want them to go repeat. Mm-hmm. Right. So you had that, that, uh, I help statement you were about to give is so great. People need to hear that to mm-hmm. really understand mm-hmm. lawyer can mean a lot of things. Yes. <laughs> lawyer can sound scary. Yes. But you're the opposite. You're not scary. You're helping. <laughs> well, even worse, lawyer sounds like, hey, I've got this problem with my landlord, you know. So right. Oh, that's yeah. me. It's like, that's, yeah, that's right. Don't <laughs> invite the wrong conversation you don't want in. And by being really strong <laughs> in how you show up in your messaging can really <laughs> navigate the conversation. Good, good point. <laughs> All right. So we're finally going to get to leverage. So our favorite. Okay. Lawyer. Yes. Yes. So, you know, hourly to exit podcast, we talk about, you know, moving from hourly, building scalable businesses that hopefully we can sell someday. And the key to that is creating leverage in our businesses. I like to talk about it as decoupling our income from our time. Tell me how you work with your clients to get leverage in their business. Well, first of all, yes, let's absolutely get out of that racket of trading dollars for hours. It's just not, uh, it doesn't make sense, really. Um, If you're changing someone's life and you can do it in a half hour, is that really only worth, you know, $300? (laughs) Um, So one of the things is actually that we're not trading dollar for hours. We're, We're pricing based on transformation and impact. Um. Another way I help people leverage is always asking the question, what can you do? So whether that's creating a product or a service that you know you can sell right now without any required um, refining. So I encounter a lot, a lot, a lot of my clients are people who, if they don't identify as perfectionists, they have perfectionism behaviors. And one of those looks like, oh, I just need to go get another certification or I just need to research a little bit more before I'm ready to do this thing. I suspect lawyers might also be in that bucket because there is, uh, yeah, like we have to do things by the books. We have to go get our proper permission slip before we can do this thing. And the beauty of entrepreneurship is uh, as long, of course, like we're doing, we're ethically selling what we know we can sell. Um the permission slip lies within you. (laughs) So (laughs) you don't need to wait for anybody else. So leveraging, what can I do now? Who is in front of me? Where else can I go? And we apply that to building out what is the thing you're selling. And if you're already selling something that's working well, and we need to, or you you're looking for a higher earning ceiling, then, okay, how can we leverage the thing that's selling really well into making a lower priced offer that gives a little bit of access to that thing that's selling really well at a more affordable rate that doesn't take any more time from you. You might not even need to do anything extra. It might actually save you time to sell it in this way. And the same applies to your marketing. What do I have right in front of me? Who do I know? What kind of asks can I make in terms of sharing my offer or sharing my free webinar? Um, inviting people to um, grab my free PDF. Um, And then same with sales. Uh, Leveraging in terms of who is someone that's complementary to what I'm doing that has access to more people I know I can help. Asking if there's a collab potential in there. Um, I mean, a business can fully thrive from the Petri dish that is leverage. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. So you mentioned pricing and pricing based on value as opposed to hours or deliverables. And I imagine perfectionists have real trouble. I imagine they have a lot of trouble with that, you know, because there's a whole mindset thing. But but I know I can do it in an hour. So how am I going to charge, you know, $20,000 that I can do like in my sleep? Like, do you help them with 
get over those mindset issues or in how of course, you- of course. <laughs> um, you know, with pricing, it's there's a lot of nuance in this conversation because it really depends on where the entrepreneur is. If there's someone who is not selling nearly enough um, and they just need to make more money, I'm actually less inclined to fight with them about adjusting their pricing and more inclined to focus on what is the thing that needs to change to get you to sell more? Because once you sell one or two at this rate that isn't good, you're going to understand that. You're going to feel it. Mm -hmm. And so then you're going to be willing to make the change. So I don't make people do anything. And that's (laughs) as someone who loves to control things, which is why I struggle so much with all the other things internally of, of, of just life in general. Um, uh, you know, being a coach is like the ultimate practice of releasing and detaching and helping people do the same with themselves and detaching from the outcomes of what they're creating. And when it comes to pricing, it's usually not going to feel urgent to change their prices until they're burning themselves out Or they have a client that's not a good fit because pricing can help you. Pricing can help you get the right people in the door who are really committed Mm -hmm. to either making the change that they want to make that, that you can help them with or yeah, getting the thing that you offer. And it can also, um, pricing allows entrepreneurs to play differently and I talk, I recently was talking with a client about like, how would you be behaving if you were someone that charged a number that makes you want to throw up like a thousand dollars an hour or something or $10,000 an hour? Would you be behaving the same way as you do now? So let's start acting like the woman who charges $10,000 an hour. She's probably for ease, not charging by the hour and just creating a lump sum. Right. in working with her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That I, I definitely, you know, cause I am straddling these worlds of being a lawyer, you know, where and, <laughs> and being referred business, that's like someone's looking for an IP lawyer and, and being referred this business and having to have these conversations where they expect someone who's just going to charge by the hour and they have a general idea of what it will be. And, and, and having to push back on, you know, I don't do that anymore. You know, I do these types of high impact things that would make sense for me to work with those types of clients. And it is, it takes, it takes um, one, you know, having confidence in your ability to do the other stuff and, and, um, and to disappoint people. I mean, cause it's hard. It's hard for a lot of us to say no. Right. You know, yeah. even when we know this isn't a good fit, but I could help them. It'd be, really easy for me to help them. <laughs> well, and <laughs> also when someone is pushing back by getting nickel and diming on the price, that's your opportunity as a, as a business owner to, this is a lesson I learned driving the Wienermobile. It's, it's bridging the topic to what is the bigger concern. If they're nickel and diming you for the price, then let's go back to, okay, why are they really here? And you can ask them. So wait, what do you really want? Why is this important to you? Okay, so here's what what it costs. Mm -hmm. Is it more important to you to pay a little less or to actually get the thing that you're looking for? That's great. Usually yeah. you want to say it a little nicer than that, but yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Like, to understand, <laughs> Sometimes like, not. The outcome? Like we're not talking about, you know, the deliverable. Yeah. We're, we're, we're talking about the outcome. Like what's the outcome you want? And what is that? What's that worth to you? And then you yeah. Say, hey, but, like yeah. I always say, what is the desired transformation? You know, like <laughs> people want to be on the other side of the rainbow. They don't want just one step forward. Mm-hmm. And so do them the favor and sell them the thing that takes them all the way to the other side of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. which is probably less work for you might cost them more, but we'll have them showing up to get to the other side of the Mm -hmm. rainbow Mm -hmm. and not playing small by just being like, well, what's the next brick right in front of me? It's like, help them lift their head up, open their eyes and look farther ahead. 
mm-hmm. and help them and push them mm-hmm. to the end of the rainbow. Right. Yeah. And they may have incorrectly self-diagnosed the problem as well. Like they may think that this is what, oh, they, yes. this is right, what they need as well. So, all right. Yes. So, so let's connect this to intellectual property, shall we? <laughs> sure. So, so when, you know, when I uh, talk to experts about kind of making that leverage leap, we talk about um, turning their expertise into intellectual property so that they have assets. I mean, you need to have assets in order to build um, something that you can repurpose, um, make more efficient, perhaps sell separately, and a business that you could sell someday. So when you're working with your clients, does intellectual property ever come in part of the conversation or asset building or how, how does that conversation go? Yes. And I always say, you got to talk to a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing I got you here. <laughs> yes. We talk about, I, I mean, we talk about IP in terms of, you know, we need to be mindful of always giving credit where it's due. Um, and, and being intentional about what are we saying? Is it something that we've picked up from someone else or is it actually mm-hmm. your own yeah. IP? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I imagine because I, I know I've seen this on the consultant side where people are getting like certifications here and there and all these things. And that's basically what they're offering is a compilation of different certifications rather than having their own original kind of uh, materials. Oh, yeah. And I imagine that happens in the coaching side as well. A hundred percent. I mean, even the way I work with people, you know, I'm not using specific language with you that I um, do use with my clients internally because that language is not my IP. I'm certified under a specific methodology, but it's not my own. And so I will give credit when I'm giving it, when I'm repeating it to my clients. I say, you know, this is that methodology and I really like it and I'm sharing it with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't do it publicly and in marketing and just because it's not mine to share. Right. That is so smart. Yeah, Cause you know, when I talk to people about creating licensing programs or other things like that, you know, you, ha- it has to be your stuff. You know, when you're getting something from a certification program or for, from a, some training that you received, that is for you to use with your clients. It's not uh-huh. to train other people to use, you know, that would, that would be a sub-license and certainly that is restricted under the permissions that you have to use it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the rule of thumb for me is if it's, if it's, um, if I'm in a place with people where I could be selling something to them, don't use that language. Don't use that methodology. Wait until they're a client who signed a contract. (laughs) It's just safer that way. Perfect, perfect. And it's also a good exercise in figuring out, like, if I do work um, with people in a way that is using a methodology that I have a license for, let's get into the practice of figuring out how we would talk about it ourselves. Mm-hmm. Eventually, like 99.9% of my clients are going to be in a place where they want to have their own IP that they can then, you know, license or at least protect legally in some way. So, this is a good exercise in figuring out what the heck that even is. Right. Absolutely. All right. So this is a very meta podcast, as you know, female founders of expertise-based businesses who are building them to hopefully sell them someday. So tell me, are you building your business to hopefully sell it someday? Oh, oh, I thought you meant to sell something. Uh, Uh, (laughs) The exit part of, (laughs) I was like, yeah, I'm selling things all that I've been talking about sales. That's a really interesting question that I don't think I've ever applied to myself. And I, I've definitely listened to other episodes, but it hasn't actually occurred to me right now. Would I sell my business? I actually don't know. Is that, 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 is, a fair, answer? that is a fair question, but you know, I like to say like, you know, you have to be thinking about exit yeah. because the same things that you do to help scale your business, to put leverage in your business are the same things that create a saleable business. So yeah. you're creating assets when you're creating independence from you personally providing the services, putting systems in yeah. place. Those are all I think to build a business. I think the answer is yes. And, um, you know, my business currently 
is super personal. I don't have any other coaches under me using my methodology. And I know that day will come where I'm going to want to start outsourcing people to work within my world. And I think in a way I see that as selling when I've removed myself as a touch point so that I can do other stuff, lean harder into my speaking gigs and workshop opportunities. Um, I look at that as selling, even though it's still probably a business run by me. So I'm going to say that's yes. A scale, that's a scaling part on your way to building a business. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> what a long answer to a yes or no question. <laughs> it, it worked. All right. So as we wrap up here, so at Think Beyond IP and the Hourly to Exit podcast, we believe in creating an economy that works for everyone. And so we love to give shout outs to organizations and people who help create a more equitable economy. Do you have an organization that you'd like to share? I do. Um, I think I share, I'm trying to remember which one I shared with you earlier, but I know that I mentioned the Tia Foundation. Yes, you sure did. Okay. So um, the, I know the founder, her name is Maymuna. Oh, I always just call her Maymuna. Maymuna Hesun. <laughs> no, Hussein Katan. Oh yes. God. If Maymuna is <laughs> listening, I'm so sorry if I just butchered your name, but Tia is all about creating communities of support and um, organizes access to economic opportunities for refugees or immigrants or displaced indigenous communities. So there's the foundation. And also, if you're located in Los Angeles, they have a restaurant called, oh, no. Oh no, what's the restaurant? I was on their website earlier today, so I should know this. Too. It's really close to my house. Shoot, I'm so sorry to your editor. It's little <laughs> flavors from afar. Flavors from afar. <laughs> Tia Foundation has a restaurant in Los Angeles um, called Flavors from Afar. And it they hire immigrants and refugees. They have chefs bringing in their own homeland um, expertise cuisines. And it's a wonderful place to just give people who have been displaced income so that they can start their lives comfortably here. So I'm a really big fan of Maymuna and the Tia Foundation. Oh, that love Ethiopian food. And yes. next time I'm in LA, I will make sure I check it out. because that's Yeah. Really so I know that you have a offer for the audience. Would you like to share that? Yes. I have a mini course totally free available. It's called Create Your Pathway to Profit. Uh, if you go to kyliehodges.com slash free, you can grab it and you're going to get a workbook that you can sit down and crank out all at once if you want. Or if you have ADHD and can't handle getting stuff done for more than 10 minutes, you will get seven videos over seven days that are five minutes long, walking you through one section of the workbook at a time. So you watch the five minute video, you spend five minutes on the workbook, and in one week you will have created a whole plan to profit. That is fantastic. All of this thank will you. be in the show notes. So uh, be easy to find. And I, I thank you for that. That's very generous. So thank where you. Can find, where can people find you? Oh, well, people can find me on Instagram or LinkedIn. My name is Kylie Hodges on both. Mm -hmm. And um, you can also shoot me an email if you want to, if you want to start talking one-on-one. -on -one. I, I love connecting with people, of course, as someone who talked about community for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> My email is Kylie. Kylie is ready to take your question. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about hot dogs or business? <laughs> I don't care. Um, it's Kylie at KylieHodges.com. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. This was a great conversation.